in this video, we will be talking about different types of pixel chips and the pros and cons of each. But before we proceed, I'd like to give an example of why this matters. Now, in the prior video, we did talk about color depth or the number of bits per color. Now, each pixel chip has a different type of bits per color. I've set up a demonstration in which we have a 6803 for this round module. The 6803 chip allows for five bits per color. Five bits per color allows 32 shades per color, so that means there are 32 shades for red, 32 for blue, and 32 for green. Now, <clears throat> we have a 1804 module. The 1804 has eight bits per color. Now, what I'm going to do is use a test tool that's shown on the screen here, and I'm going to be fading all the way from 0 through 255. Now, within DMX, there are 256 possible levels of intensity. Now, each pixel has three channels, one channel for each individual color. So that means that there can be up to 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits, or 24 total bits of color for one individual pixel. So that would be the ideal amount. So in this particular case, the 1804 matches with its level of output, which is 8 bits per pixel, to the level of output possible with DMX. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to step through the intensity. Now I will warn you that this uh, controller is uh, new and uh, there's some unresolved issues with this type of pixel that I'm having. And so you may see some shimmering, but the example will still show you why a chip that has a higher bits per color is better. So I'm currently on intensity zero, which is off. Uh, 255 would be the highest level. Now, I'm going to step up. I'm going to go to one. <clears throat> now, again, you do see some flashing in here, but you'll see that the 1804, or the eight bits per color pixel, uh, is on. The 6803 has yet to turn on. So I'm going to continue up two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this right here at eight is should be where we see our 6803. Now if we took 256, divided it by 32, we would end up with eight, which means that this is the first level of fade possible. So at this point, you see our 6803 come on. Now you may also see these pixel nodes. These pixel nodes are also 6803. They're just in a different form. Now, you will be seeing some flashing, but that's not normal. Now, I'm going to proceed up. Now, the it just made another jump right there for the 6803 because we hit 16. And then as I proceed up, we hit 32. We get another jump in color. So as I proceed up, they're getting brighter and brighter. Now, at this point, if we're looking at them, and it may be hard to see in this video, we're at 96. Um, they look visually, from here, very similar. The levels of output are, are, are about equivalent. That is because fading is not linear. It's not nice and smooth as you would imagine a dimmer used in your house. Um, so where most of the fading occurs is at the lower levels, and where you get the most levels of differentiation at those lower levels is with a chip that supports more bits per color. So I'm going to continue up here. I'm now at 120. They're getting brighter and they're getting brighter, but it's not exceptionally bright uh, in the sense that it, it, it's equal throughout the entire fading range. Again, because they are not linear and I'm going to fade all the way up and now we're at 255. Now, these two, because they share the exact same types of uh, LEDs, which are both 50-50s, the level of output generally should be exactly the same. And visually looking here, they are. Now you may see some difference uh, in different types of LEDs. So for example, this is an eight millimeter pixel node, and it has a, a, even a slightly different tinge of color, but still um, a different level of output. So that is why you would want a pixel using a chip that has more bits per color and a protocol that supports 
those bits per color, ideally up to eight bits per color. So as I move back down to the fading again, you can see they start to drop, and once we hit below eight, the lower bits per pixel, 6803, is completely cut off until we go down to one where and zero. Now let's talk a little bit about the pixel chips themselves. Now, just as a recap, what a pixel chip is, it is the intelligent chip in each individual pixel that controls the LEDs and handles the data coming in and going out of the pixel. Each individual pixel has one of these and it can vary. Now, one thing to be aware of is that there are different kinds and we will talk about each individual type of pixel chip. Um, each pixel chip has pros and cons. There's no one best pixel chip that meets all needs. You'll see that some have advantages for voltage, some have disadvantages for color depth, some have uh, advantages for uh, cost, some do not have advantages, some have better support in controllers, and some do not. Now, one of the differences in a particular pixel chip would be its ability to control the LEDs. Now, we have just talked about color depth, and that is one important piece of how a chip uh, is either advantageous or not advantageous. The other is the way in which it physically controls the power going to the LED. Now, there are two basic types of those controls. There is constant voltage and constant current. Now, um, in a constant current, for example, a 2801 pixel chip has the ability to do constant current. What that means is, is that if you have a long string of pixels, that the first pixel in the line and the last pixel in the line should have the same output. Because when we control LEDs, we're controlling the current. And if we can limit that current very exactly so that it's the same when it's on the first pixel versus the last pixel, we have an advantage to making them consistent. Now, on a constant voltage setup, for example, um, here we have an 1804, um, which is constant voltage. That can mean that voltage coming down the line as it gets consumed uh, is less at the end than it is at the beginning. But because the current is not being controlled, the chip's ability to control the exact level of output at the very beginning versus the very end um, is not as good. Now, in most cases, for what we're probably using them for, which is for Christmas displays where your viewers are 50 feet away, you're probably not going to notice these differences. Even if these differences amount to as much as 30% difference between the first and the last pixel, you probably won't be able to see that from the viewing distance that most of our displays are set up as. Now, one of the other things I touched on before was that if you're using DMX, and there may be other protocols like PixelNet or LOR protocol or who knows what in the future, um, each one of those has a certain amount of information it carries for each individual channel. And again, for Pixel, we have three channels for each individual color. Within DMX, which is the most common protocol, you would have eight bits per color, which means you have a maximum of 256 shades in that particular color. So, ideally, you'd look for a pixel if you're using DMX or any protocol that supports eight bits of color, um, eight bits of color depth within your chip. Now, um, the chips that I'm about to mention are the DIY type style. Um, they are available in certain co-ops. Um, they may in fact be one sold in commercial controllers such as LOR or d -Light. But because those vendors aren't publishing that information, uh, the pixels used by those vendors may or may not be uh, usable with generic controller hardware that we'll talk about in a later video. But let me start through the different types of pixel chips. Now, the first is the 6803. The 6803, um, it has five bits per color, which means it has 32 shades. It is a four-wire connection. It means it has uh, a power, two power, and a data clock wire. Now, 
the, the main disadvantage of the 6803 is that it, it does only have 5 bits per pixel, which means its fading quality is not as good. The advantages are that it's widely available in different formats. For example, here I have a 6803 in a pixel node. I have a 6803 in a uh, pixel module. And then over here, we have 6803 in pixel strip. So, it's, uh, it's pretty ubiquitous. It's available in most form factors. Um, it's well supported. And uh, it's fairly proven because it's been around a while. Now, uh, it does support both current, constant current and constant voltage. Um, but that depends on the particular manufacturer and the way they've implemented it. Now, next on our list here is the uh, 2801. This is a uh, rolled semi, 2801 pixel. Um, they are found in pixel strip. Um, they are also found in uh, pixel nodes most commonly. The voltage that they run at is usually 5 volts. Um, it is 4 wires. Now, these do generally run constant current. Um, they do run at 5 volts, so you do need a 5 volt power supply. But because they are constant current, you have very consistent output, and because they're also 8-bit, the output that is out is very good, consistent, and uh, we have next on our list here, the 1804. 1804 um, comes in a variety of different formats. Uh, it comes in a pixel module. It comes in the hybrid strip uh, bar. Um, it also comes in pixel nodes, similar to these. So it comes in a wide variety of formats. Uh, it is 8 bits per color. So it has a very good fading. Now, its disadvantage is that it is constant voltage. Because it is constant voltage, you will get a drop in output from the beginning to the end of the string. Um, now, the number of devices that contain the 1804 are, while they're varied, they're not ubiquitous across a lot of different manufacturers, so you may find some problems finding different kinds. So if you have quality issues with one particular module or you want a specialized module that's maybe not rectangular, you may have some issues there. Um, it is a fairly new chip. It's 18 months old. Um, but uh, its it main advantage is that it does run at 12 volts which means that you can run quite a few of these, and it also only has three wires uh, required for, for uh, data. Now, we also have an SD600, SD600s. Uh, I do not have an example here. Uh, they're made by a company uh, that is called Yingdang Data Systems. Um, the pixels that they incorporate those chips into, um, while fairly varied, generally have uh, had quality issues. So the 60, uh, SD600 has had some quality issues in those particular types of pixels. Now, another pixel that is not supported by any DIY or mm, Christmas-oriented controller is the 3005. Now, this manufacturer refuses to release the protocol, but people are working on uh, reverse engineering it. It is available in a lot of interesting formats. You can see a little rectangular module, a square module of four LEDs. Um, we've got a uh, module here. Um, and so it's available in a lot of different formats, and so hopefully that will be supported in the future. Um, that would also be the advantage of having a vendor who sells a controller that has updatable firmware, uh, and that has the ability to support additional new protocols as different types of pixels come on, uh, pixel chips come onto the market. Okay, so those are the major types of pixel chips. Now, when we're talking about pixels or we're talking about simple RGB, you can't not talk about quality. Now, there's a lot of things going on in the market today. These pixels, while they have been around for a few years, um, these RGB devices have highly varied levels of quality. And let's go through some of these and uh, talk about where these might be a problem. Now, one of these, uh, for example, uh, here's a vendor, Addison, uh, that I used last year. These uh, simple RGB modules, these are not pixels, just RGB modules. Um, I had a failure rate of 20%. Uh, 
Uh, some fail right out of the box. I would have to hook them up before I even started using them. And then I had a large failure of these individual pixel, uh, these modules after they were in, in uh, use. So I have used other pixel modules and not had problems. Um, I've used simple RGB modules and not had problems. So it can vary from vendor to vendor as to what problems you may have. Unless there is an absolute known and that the vendor is known to have good quality or is known to do burn-in testing or is uh, warrantied by your vendor, I would highly recommend, first, before you mount anything permanently, you glue, attach, build, I would test your pixels or your simple RGB modules or devices before you install them. Then, after you've built your particular elements, so for example, if you're building a mini tree, you're building a mega tree, run those pixels for a week or two. Just let them run constantly, fading through the different levels to see what failures you're going to get. You will more than likely, if you have any quantity, um, have failures. Now, um, what you should be aware of is that you would think that these things are built on some sort of automated assembly line. That is not the case. Almost all of these RGB items are hand done. They're hand soldered, they're hand potted, um, they're assembled. So for example, you may have them cut by hand, the wires. So there's a lot of variability in these devices because of that human element. Now, that is one advantage um, because some manufacturers will make custom runs for you. So you can find a manufacturer, for example, if you didn't like this particular spacing of these pixel nodes, what you could do is you could have them made with four, six, eight. Um, I had that done with a particular module. For example, this module didn't normally come spaced so far apart, and I had eight inches put between each one, which of course means that they had to cut them uniquely for my particular need uh, and then hand saw to them. Now, um, one thing to be aware of, you may see ratings. If you're familiar with industrial ratings, you may see something that says like IP66 or the infamous IP68. Um, vendors on websites will list different waterproof levels. Um, and generally speaking, you can't trust them a single bit. You can have something that is IP rated to be submersible in water and still functional. And it will have complete holes and gaps that allow water into electronic circuit boards. So whenever you see a particular rating, do not trust it. Only trust it after you've ordered samples or you have assurances from your vendor that it meets given uh, quality levels. I would always recommend if you're going to be making a large purchase, so if you are going to be purchasing a thousand of these pixel modules, don't order them directly over the internet and assume that 1,000 will show up perfectly exactly the way you expected. They may have the wrong spacing. They may have the wrong color. They may have changed. The photo on the website was not anything what, what you actually received. Um, and so be aware that they may have even done them, uh, uh, d assembled them in a way that uh, is not what you would have expected. I'll give you an example. Here we have some pixels. And these pixels um, have some glue that separates in the center here. Um, but if we go through and look at each one, we can see that there's gaps. This glue doesn't even completely seal up this. They made an attempt, but it didn't actually work. I would hate to get a thousand of these, discover that they have this problem, uh, and then be forced to use them. And returning them often is not uh, a possibility. So do your homework. Now, another piece that you should be aware of is that if you're working in extreme environments, either extremely hot or extremely cold, so if you're running an environment that has negative 20, 30 degree temperatures, uh, Fahrenheit, test them. Put them in your freezer. Find the coldest environment. Run them for a week in that environment. You may find that while something works fine in regular room temperature, has start it has uh, oddities or unique behaviors as they... Uh, go down in temperature. For example, I've heard rumors that this particular DMX module at extremely low sub-freezing uh, temperatures starts to act a little funny, but once it warms up, 
it's fine. So you'd want to test those environments um, against, or those items in the environments that you intend to use them. Now, one other thing to be aware of with a specific, particular type of uh, pixel is the pixel nodes. Now, the pixel nodes, uh, what they are is they are um, a little circuit board that has wires soldered to each side of the circuit board. That is then encased in a little protective sealant. Um, this may vary. Sometimes there's two levels. Sometimes there's an epoxy. But what ends up happening is, is you have usually either a gap between them um, or that there's not enough strength for you to hold these and have them strung, for example, on a mini uh, mega tree. So if you're going to use these in a mega tree and you're going to use them freestanding like you might expect you could do with traditional LEDs, you might experience some failures. In pixel nodes, what I would recommend is attaching these directly to some sort of substrate, like a wire or a rope, uh, zip tying them, so that the length of them is supported not by the wires and the nodes themselves, but by the string or wire. Uh, you'll get much better uh, longevity out of them. Uh, other people have reported by putting a zip tie at the bottom and then uh, uh, spreading that load against the zip tie as opposed to the circuit board. Uh, that also works, but you'll need to do some testing. Again, testing, testing, testing is the uh, best way to determine whether or not these are going to work for you. Now, wiring. Um, there is no single standard for wiring, even in pixels. So for example, in this pixel, or I'm sorry, in this RGB module, it's just a simple RGB module, we have positive uh, 12 volts as red. Okay, that makes sense. We have green as yellow. We have red as green, and we have blue as the actual blue color. Makes no sense. Why would you use? green for red when you could use it on the green. So there's no consistency. Here's how bad the inconsistencies are within items coming out of China. For example, same pixel. Different color wires from different runs. This was ordered at one time, this was ordered at another. You can see that they've, shipped, they've switched the wiring colors. Now, does red mean red? Does blue mean blue? Why did white change to black or black change to white? So be aware that they do have issues. There are even known issues that because these are hand done, there are errors, that as it's going through the pixels, the colors will change midstream. That's not common, but it does occasionally happen. So never assume that a particular color, just because I got this one before and it was red was positive and green was negative that that's the way it is. That is not the way it is. Um, that varies from pixel to pixel. Okay. Now, also be aware that when you order these you may get uh, various different changes um, even in things like uh, uh, the amount of potting the wire size, you may get uh, 24 gauge one time, 20 gauge the next, 22 gauge the time after. Um, it varies. This is where it's very important to be specific with the vendor that you're purchasing them from, telling them exactly what you want. Don't leave anything to chance. Okay. Now, um, another thing to be aware of with uh, RGB devices um, and in particular pixels, is that we refer to them most often as RGB, red, green, blue. And we would assume that if this was set up, the channels would be in order red, green, blue. But that is not always the case. Some pixels have blue, green, red, green, blue, red. There are up to uh, six different combinations that they can exist in. Now, what this, why this matters is because your software or your controller needs to handle this appropriately. So for example, if your software can only work with devices designed in red, blue, and green order, so that channel 1 is red, channel 2 is green, and channel 3 is blue, you're going to have some problems if your devices are not red, blue, red green, blue. So 
you have one of two options. Either one, you use software that does support any combination of colors, of the three different colors. Or you can have a controller that allows you to move those channels around so that it virtually appears to your software to be that particular color combination. So while this may be blue, green, red, you could control it at the controller level by saying that is actually red, blue, green. So be aware of that. Um, even within standard pixels, uh, don't assume that everything is wired when it's on the circuit board as red, blue, green. For example, sometimes pixel strip, um, oh, I'm sorry, just regular strip might have red, green, blue. It might have some other different order. So be aware of that when you are specking your pixels, if that's important to you, or that you choose a controller uh, or software that does that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what advantages and disadvantages there are for RGB devices versus your traditional incandescent and LED strings hooked up to AC-based controllers. Now, one of the most obvious advantages for RGB is its ability to create any color. So, for example, I could put up these modules and I could put them up on my house or in trees or in the bushes. I could put up those and leave them up for Halloween and then transition right into Christmas without having to remove anything because I've got purple and green here. I also have green and red. So every color is already accounted for. I don't need different lights for different seasons. Now, um, the traditional method of using multiple colors within traditional LED strings, whether those be incandescent or LEDs, um, is to take and make what's called a super string. For example, you may take three different colors or four different colors, red, blue, green, red, green, white, red, blue, green, white, uh, and mix them into one huge string of lights all zip tied together. Now, the obvious disadvantage is that there's some cost there having to purchase each individual string. Uh, if one string goes bad, you have to then pull them all apart. Um, you have the physical size of those strings. When you have three or four strings of LEDs, you have a huge amount of wire. And so there's weight and storage issues. Uh, so simplicity wise, RGB beats that because it's simple. It's in one spot. Um, if one goes bad, you can cut it out, replace it. You don't have to tear apart your entire uh, string. Now, you also have, I would say, more options in terms of physical formats. Um, we've shown you some different formats. You know, For example, we have modules. Um, we have what look like traditional uh, mini lights. Um, now, you'll also see that other vendors will be coming out, such as LOR with its color cosmic bulbs, um, with even covers for these to make them look like traditional C9s or C7s. So I think as the market progresses and uh, RGB becomes more common, you will see even more replicas of traditional lights. Now, there are some shortcomings there because not all of these different types support things that look like um, M6s or they look exactly like C9s. Now, you do have other kinds. For example, we have uh, the hybrid, where we have strip in a rigid container. Um, one of my favorites, of course, uh, strip, which means basically you just roll that out. You can make a arch in the span of 10 minutes with this, as where with a traditional wrapped arch, you'd spend hours and hours and hours. So. There's some advantages to the different formats um, that RGB offers physically. Now, um, it's, not completely uh, it's not completely fair to compare traditional LED lights uh, or incandescent lights to RGB, um, not even on a cost basis, just in their physical differences, because they are two different genres of lighting they are very different. So they're not exactly comparable. It's probably more accurate to compare incandescence with standard LED strings. Now, um, disadvantages. Now, disadvantages of pixels and RGB. Uh, as to pixels, 
Uh, the obvious is there is a slight increase in costs. Now, that varies depending on what you're going to try to accomplish. Um, the most obvious thing is going to be the increase in your channel count, where most displays maybe were running with uh, standard LED strings or incandescent strings, might have been running, say, 200 or 300 channels. A comparable display might now run two, three, four thousand channels. When you have that many channels, you have a lot more complexity in programming, and the software is starting to catch up, but it's not completely there. Um, you have more complexity in interfaces. Um, you have more options, because before you just simply plugged some LED strings into an in incandescent, incandescent or LED strings into a controller, and that was it. Now you have to worry about the controllers and the protocols and does this talk to that? And we will be talking about that later. Um, the other is that there's not a lot of standardization. For example, with standard LED or incandescent strings, there's a plug that always fits into another plug. It's always standardized. With RGB, that is not the case. There is no standard connector for any given type of pixels. So be aware of that. You will be DIY on a lot of these items unless you purchase it from a commercial vendor, which has some other issues.